Son of the Holy Spirit. St. Paul, this is to the Ephesians, says that you are quickened together. While you were still dead in sin, you were quickened together with Christ. This word quickened, of course, we don't use very often anymore, but it means made alive, full of life, enlivened. Sometimes you've heard of old translations about the quick and the dead, the living and the dead. James the Persian is one who is made alive in Christ, though he were dead in sins. We also hear him say, By grace you are saved through faith, it's not of your own doing, it's not of your own works. Now, of course, many in the Protestant world have taken that to an extreme, to which it means we don't do anything, and it's all grace, all grace, all grace, forgetting synergy and working along with God and cooperating with God. But indeed, it is God's grace that saves us. It is God's grace with that faith that we have in that saves us. That works that we do show forth our faith. We do those works because we are Christians. Much as a bird flies and a fish swims, Christians do good works. We open our hearts to the presence of God's grace. He doesn't force it upon us. And that is exactly what we have with James. One who gave his life so fully over to Christ, his faith showed forth that he no longer lived but Christ lived in him. He was quickened in Christ. St. James in Persia had a Christian mother, a Christian father, and he was given a Christian wife who was very pious. But in the middle of all this, he worked for King Yazdegerhur, who was a pagan, of course. And the more influence he had around this king, the more he began to follow his ways, and of course he liked all the glory, he liked all the perks that came in being around the king. And he renounced Christ and became a pagan. Well, it wasn't long after this that he received a letter from his mother and his wife. If I had it in front of me, I would read it to you, the copy of what they said. But it was rather several paragraphs, the most beautiful things you'll ever hear, that showed forth a true mother and wife's love for their loved one. They did not pull punches with him. They said, you have traded your immortal soul for mortality. You have traded truth for falsehood and lies. You have traded life for death, the true and living God for falsehood and deception and delusion. Over and over and over they warned him these things. You have traded immortality in eternity in hell by turning away from the living God. Of course, he was pierced in his heart by these words, thank God. And he was overheard praying by some of the king's court and weeping. And they go, of course, and tell King Yazdegerhur that James is a Christian. He calls forth James and he asks him, are you a Nazarene? He says, I am a Christian and have always followed Christ. I am a follower of the Nazarene. So he warns him of what will happen if he does not renounce this and threatens him. James is glad to die for Christ because he realized that he has denied Christ. He must confess Christ before men, to be confessed before the angels in heaven. It begins one of these very gruesome martyrdoms, which it can no longer be simply a man. It has to be grace acting within them through faith. This man had great faith, or he could not have endured these things. They begin to threaten him, and he does not flinch. They determine his torture. You'll understand in a moment why the gospel was read for, for James, which was from John about the vine. It's not a typical martyr reading. The first thing they do is begin to cut off every one of his digits, one by one. They cut off the first finger, of course in pain, but James says, as a branch is cut off from the vine, and the eye bear forth good fruit. They are stunned by him quoting scriptures as he's being tortured. They threaten him and threaten him. They cut off a second finger. And he says, Behold, this vine is a vineyard that has been planted, quoting the scriptures, once again begging that he might be a vine in the vineyard of Christ. They 
proceed to the third. And he says, may the three primary passions be taken away from me, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. May it be as Ananias, Azariah, and Misael, the three used in the furnace, giving glory to God, and glory to the Holy Trinity, all of course threes, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're amazed by this, but their anger continues and continues and continues. He's continued made more alive if they think they're destroying him. They cut off the fourth, and he say, says, May I be as the three beasts or the three creatures portrayed in the Apocalypse and, of course, in Ezekiel. The one with the face of a man, the one with the face of a lion, the one with the face of a bull, and the one with the face of an eagle, always having my eyes upon my Lord. They proceed to the fifth, and you say, May I be as those wise five virgins who are prepared for the coming of their Lord, having oil plenty. They go to the sixth, and he says, My Lord was crucified at the sixth hour, as we say in the troparium of the sixth hour during Lent. And that's that Lord to accept him. They go to the seventh, and he cites David. We prayed seven days a week, and of course, seven times a day, and I praise thee, O Lord. We go to the eighth, and he looks to the Lord who was circumcised on the eighth day. Recognize that humility, condescend to our human weakness to fulfill the law for us, and give glory to God for his love and his mercy. We go to the ninth finger. In the ninth finger, he says, Lord, who died, of course, in that passion on the cross at the ninth hour. Of course, once again, accept me. We go to the tenth. He cites the Ten Commandments and says, May I praise thee as a ten-string psaltery, as in the Psalms. I will continue with the rest. If you want to read the rest, you may. They proceed to cut off every toe, feet, hands, arms. Of course, you imagine this has to be Incredibly brutal, incredibly brutal, the pain that must have been there. But no man can endure this who is not quickened in Christ, who does not have great faith. He saw that he had denied Christ. Of course, we deny Christ with every one of our sins. We deny Christ when we judge others. St. Ignatius Ryachavinov says the judgment of a brother or gossip is nothing but antichrist. We do deny Christ. And we must confess Christ. It doesn't mean we're going to undergo martyrdom, but it does mean we must bear the difficulties that come our way. When the difficulties do come our way, we must be as the wise thief and be able to say, we have received the due reward for our deeds, Lord, remember me in thy kingdom. We must be able to say, as Jesus in Gethsemane, shall I not drink the cup? which my Father has given me to drink, whatever trials come in our life. But in all of them, glory to God for everything, glory to God for all things. And we see that exemplified in James the Persian, who no matter what happened to him after his denial, when he accepted Christ by faith, accepted <coughs> the grace that the Lord gave him, who tells us to forgive 70 times seven, if he tells us to forgive 70 times seven, Indeed, the Lord will forgive us beyond 70 times 7. He desires our repentance. He desires our turning to him. And much as the Lord did not like the hypocrite who did not want the withered woman to be healed, he wants us to renounce that hypocrisy and to fill our lives with Christ and everything that we do, to fill ourselves up with Christ and to be real wherever we are, to be honest Christians, to not call ourselves Orthodox Christians and then not pray, to call ourselves Orthodox Christians and not fast, to call ourselves Orthodox Christians and not live the life of the church. It's hypocrisy. To live the life of James the Persian, who always had on the tip of his tongue the words of the Holy Scriptures and the teachings of the church. Obviously, this was a lot of grace at this point to be able to do that in that moment. That's what we are taught to do by the fathers of the church, to immerse ourselves so deeply in those scriptures that they are the first thing that come out of our minds in any circumstance, the teachings of Christ and the gospel. 
And James gives us a profound example of that, of one who's destroyed by man, whose soul cannot be destroyed by man, but very much quickened in Christ, was saved by grace through faith, not of his works, but by his acceptance, by making himself a fertile ground that the Lord might plant that vine that might grow forth the fruit of the life eternal. Holy great martyr James, pray to God for us. Amen.